In this third and final video on the history of cameras, I'm going to be taking a look at the development of digital and smartphone cameras and discussing the innovations that have played a key role in revolutionizing how we photograph and share digital images. And I'll be highlighting some common themes that have been repeated for well over a hundred years, such as the impact on popular photography of this vest pocket Kodak camera in the early 1900s and the impact of phone cameras today. As I've mentioned in the first two videos, the focus here is on mass market cameras and popular photography, not the highly specialist cameras used, for example, by the military or by spies or in space or by professionals in the fashion, film and other industries. And I'm only looking at stills photography and not video. My objective is to explain the most significant developments in the most engaging and concise way as possible as an overview. So if you're keen to learn more about specific innovations or technologies or gear, to take just one example, different kinds of sensors, then there are loads of good sources of information out there online in books and journals. We've all been part of the history of digital cameras, and we've all got our own favorite cameras and stories to tell. This makes it doubly difficult to cover all the different kinds of cameras or innovations that you might feel are absolutely critical to recent history. So please let us know in the comments below what you think is missing or misleading in my narrative. That'll be very helpful and interesting to read. But before we get on to digital photography, i.e. the use of digital sensors to record images rather than film, it's important to consider other innovations in cameras, and in particular, the use of electronics, microprocessors, chips, and visual displays. If you look at a cutaway of a digital SLR and its lens, for instance, you can see the camera and lens are packed with electronics. The digital sensor is only one part of the overall system. Part two of this series highlighted the first autofocus point-and-shoot camera, the Konica C35AF from 1977, and the first mass-market SLR with an integrated camera lens autofocus system, the Minolta Maxim 7000, launched in 1985. After this, manufacturers designed film cameras that were packed with electronic tools to help the photographer. Electronics were used to improve how film was advanced and shots counted. Point and shoot cameras had electronically controlled zoom lenses and even power zooms in relatively small camera bodies. And cameras could also display information electronically on displays on the top of the camera through the viewfinder or on displays on the back of the camera. To look at these and other innovations, let's compare a camera like a Spotmatic SP2 from 1971 with a pre-digital film camera from 25 years later to see how cameras evolved electronically. The more modern film camera I'm going to use is this Canon EOS 500M. It was an entry-level interchangeable lens SLR film camera, not the top of the range, but quite a decent performer. The camera was first marketed in 1996, 25 years after the SP2. It's also known as the Rebel G in the US and the KISS in Japan. Starting with the Spotmatic, in the early 1970s it was one of the most popular, advanced and successful SLR cameras with through-the-lens stop-down metering and focusing, but of course it was all manual. On top it had a shutter button, a dial for setting the exposure speed, as well as the lever for advancing the film. The camera required batteries to run the metering system, and it had a hot shoe for triggering the flash. However, these were just about the only electronics used. There were no command dials. The only other setting you could change on top was the ISO or DIN of the film you were using. Down the side, you flick this SW switch for stop-down metering. And on the front, there was this manual mechanism for a self-timer. Turning to the Canon, it had a similar-looking interior for transporting the 35mm film, but a lot of things had changed over the 25 years. First of all, the camera had a built-in motor drive for automatically advancing the film, and the film advance was no longer made by moving a lever on top of the camera. That was now done electronically after each shot, as was the rewind after the film was finished, or you could rewind the film before it was finished. The camera used Canon's EF mount with an electronic signal transfer system, so the Camera Plus lens had a fully integrated autofocusing system. On the top, the camera had a built-in pop-up flash. There was an external LCD display that provided a variety of information, and some of the information is listed here. Another notable change was the introduction of a command dial with settings for automatic or manual controls or TV or AV settings. I won't describe what all these mean, and I'm sure you know most of them already. 
These command dials were introduced by many manufacturers in the 1990s, replacing a much more limited set of commands on the top of earlier film cameras. Even for the more advanced cameras, the only physical command dials they used to have were exposure speed dials, and perhaps an exposure compensation dial. And a feature of this camera that has continued to the present day is the support it gave photographers for exposure settings. It had both exposure compensation controls and auto-exposure bracketing. With bracketing, the camera took three continuous shots with three different exposures in sequence, one under, one at the standard metered value, and one over. On the back, there were two more buttons for activating various functions. And on the front, this feature could act as an AF assist beam emitter, a red-eye reduction lamp, or a self-timer lamp. So as you can see, there were a large number of technical innovations in the design and functionality of film cameras during the 25 years that followed the introduction of what you could call the modern SLR film camera. However, one has to ask, did these innovations actually result in a revolution in popular photography? Did they take photography and the sharing of photographs to a new level? Well, I don't think they did. As a photographic tool, cameras like the Canon did a good job. But really, could the Spotmatic, or say the Nikon F, from 25 years earlier, have done a similar job? Well, yes, they could, as long as you're happy with manual controls, and there's no integrated flash or red eye support, and so on, although those functions didn't always work that well. And with film cameras, you still needed to get that film developed. The film cameras of the 1990s were easier to use, but they weren't a revolution in taking and sharing photos. I wanted to spend a little time discussing the electronic command and visual display innovations introduced in film cameras in the 1990s, because these innovations were carried over into the introduction of cameras with digital sensors. Now there's a long history of inventions in stills and video photography that led to the first sale of digital cameras to the mass market, a history that I'll condense into a few key events. The first digital camera was developed in 1975 by Stephen Sasson, working at Kodak, the images were transferred onto a cassette tape, as you can see here. It wasn't until 1986 that the first commercially available digital stills camera was marketed. It was made by Canon, and it was called the RC701. It was expensive, with a tiny sensor by today's standards, and it came with a rather slow printer that apparently took three to four minutes to print an image. The camera was aimed at professional media outlets. In the mass market, I suppose that many people's first exposure to digital cameras was a point-and-shoot camera. In 1988, Fujifilm demonstrated its prototype Fujix DS-1P camera. It's considered to be the first true point-and-shoot digital camera, although it was never put on sale. At the time, it was called the Future Electronic Still Camera. Its memory card, only readable on a specialist player, held up to 10 photographs. Digital camera technology was subsequently developed and sold by many different manufacturers to replace compact film cameras. The point-and-shoot digital cameras really took the hassle out of taking photographs. They had zoom lenses and integrated flash, all in a compact and pocketable body, with no messing around with accessories or complicated settings. Above all else, users no longer had to go through the time and expense of getting film developed. Canon, who became the leading manufacturer of these types of cameras, were highly innovative in the design and marketing of their cameras, selling cameras to suit all types of photographer, from the beginner to the more sophisticated amateur. But they were by no means the only company who benefited from the digital revolution. There are many different lists of the best point-and-shoot cameras online, setting out the reasons why some cameras are better than others. I'm not going to repeat this kind of analysis here, except to say that the top-rated point-and-shoot digital cameras really are very good, even for more advanced photographers. The vast majority of the best point-and-shoots come from Japanese manufacturers, although the Japanese increasingly outsource the actual manufacturing of cameras to other countries. Critically, these cameras appeared around the same time as the introduction of personal computers and the internet, and this led to the kind of revolution and renaissance in popular photography we'd seen with vest pocket cameras. Computers enable us to store and manipulate images with post-processing software, and also look at images without the need to ever print them off physically, while the internet enables us to share images with many others, something I'll return to later. At this point, it's only fitting to include a Kodak digital point-and-shoot camera to complete the story that started with the first Brownies. As we saw in parts one and two, Kodak's more compact, less expensive cameras, together with the use of film rather than plates, revolutionized popular photography and gave ordinary people the chance to take and share photographs. 
Compact cameras like the Brownie No. 0 and the Vest Pocket Kodak from the 1910s were followed by Art Deco-style Bakelite cameras in the 1930s. And then cameras such as the Instamatic, using film cartridges, were introduced from 1963. Alongside point-and-shoot cameras, Kodak and other manufacturers produce more expensive folding or fixed-lens cameras of varying degrees of sophistication, giving photographers more control over settings. Here's a rather beautiful Voigtlander Vito from Germany. It was one of the last new compact folding cameras made, launched in 1955. And here's an example of a fixed-lens camera from Kodak, the Retinet A from 1963. However, these kinds of cameras found it hard to compete with the new interchangeable lens SLR cameras introduced in the late 1950s, and manufacturers stopped making them. On the other hand, the more compact point-and-shoot film cameras were extremely popular right up to the digital era. They were cheap and easy to use, and even cheaper when manufacturers like Fuji and others started to sell disposable film cameras. Which brings us on to the arrival of digital cameras. This particular digital model is a Kodak Easy Share from January 2009, which we bought back in those days for our daughter, and has a rear screen but no viewfinder. It was something you could put in your pocket and happily take around, and it was actively used by our family until phone cameras arrived. It's a pretty basic digital camera compared to more expensive point and shoots, but if you look closely at images from the camera on the computer, even through today's eyes used to more powerful, better sensors and lenses, then images are actually okay if you're only looking at relatively small physical print sizes, if you want to physically print the images at all. That's when the images are well focused with no shaking, because one weakness that's immediately apparent from the files is that many images suffer from camera shake, especially shots taken inside. I should have taught my daughter better to increase the ISO setting and use the fastest f-stop speed. I'll still do that at some point. While for now she's happily using her iPhone with all the software and computational support it provides for low light photos. However, before phone cameras were available, digital point and shoot cameras work well for our family and many others. And as for Kodak, the company filed for bankruptcy in 2012 and had to be bailed out. This was a sad demise for a company that even as recently as 2001 held the number two spot in digital camera sales in the US behind Sony. But by then, with a poor business model, it was losing money on every camera it was selling. One report put the figure at a $60 loss for every camera it sold. Turning to SLRs, in 1987, the first digital SLR was developed, also by Kodak. It featured a 1.3 megapixel sensor, which was integrated with a Canon F1 film SLR body. Initially, Kodak's digital SLRs were designed for governmental use, but in 1991, the company marketed the DCS100 to the general public, this time using a Nikon F3 body. In 1999, Nikon launched the D1 and displaced Kodak as the market leader in professional DSLR cameras. From then onwards, all the major manufacturers entered the market, and the battle for market share commenced. For technical reasons, many of the early mass-market digital cameras were based on crop sensors rather than full-frame 35mm equivalent sensors, and companies adopted a range of formats, including 4 thirds, 1.5, 1.6 crop, and so on. Smaller crop sensors are all very well, and are still popular with some manufacturers and photographers. But what other photographers really wanted was a sensor that mirrored 35mm film, i.e. full-frame sensors. Full-frame sensors were desirable for various reasons, not least the chance to have a traditional 35mm point of view and depth of field. And full-frame sensors evolved from 2002, when Canon released the EOS 1DS, a full-frame 11.1 megapixel camera supporting Canon's well-established EOS lineup of lenses. The EOS 1DS, unlike some earlier attempts at full-frame cameras, produced excellent results. Again, as in digital point-and-shoot cameras, a variety of manufacturers appear in the best-of lists of DSLRs online, and again they tend to be dominated by Japanese companies. But obviously we mustn't forget Leica from Germany, a company that featured strongly in part two of this history of cameras, with the development of its 35mm rangefinder cameras with interchangeable lenses. Leica's M-series cameras were iconic cameras in the film era, and in 2006, the company launched the M8, the first digital M. It featured a 10.3 megapixel sensor with a 1.33 crop. And then in 2009, they launched the M9, 
with a full frame sensor. I should also mention the development of medium format digital cameras. They're not really part of mass market popular photography, and so outside the scope of this video. But these larger format cameras can deliver exceptional results in terms of details captured. Anyway, since the introduction of DSLRs and digital rangefinders, there have been a whole host of related innovations, culminating in the launch of mirrorless and phone cameras. But before that, we need to talk about the impact of the World Wide Web. The introduction of the World Wide Web in the 1990s was another game-changing development for the photographic world, because together with personal computers and digital photo files, it resulted in a revolution in how photos are shared. Digital image files, once the internet was in full swing, enabled amateur photographers to share photographs not just with family and friends, but also with a much wider audience. Today we can post and tag our images online using forums or photo sharing sites, and those images are instantly accessible by people all around the world. In the old days, amateur photographers probably would have been delighted if their photos had a few hundred views in total, unless they were featured in newspapers or magazines. Now people's images can have millions of views, even tens of millions of views, and the most widely shared commercial images have over a billion views, an astonishing, extraordinary transformation in popular photography. This is not to say that the quality of images has improved exponentially as well. It's simply that we can all share our images with so many more people online. Another significant development in the digital era that is having a major impact on popular photography and how photographs look is the introduction of digital image processing software. I'll get on to computational photography when we discuss mobile phone cameras, but for now I'm talking about post-processing software, the manipulation of images after they're taken, something in the film era that only people directly involved in developing film could do. The vast majority of images posted online from conventional cameras have probably been processed in some way, not only JPEG-type processing engines converting raw files, but also additional processing by the photographer to modify sharpness or exposure levels or colours or other things. There are a number of debates online about the performance of these processing engines and how photographers apply tweaks to their images. More aggressive post-processing is not always a good thing in everyone's eyes, especially if you think that some digital images and colours look unrealistic or overcooked. But still, it's a feature of our digital photographic world that is here to stay. And to be fair, the doctoring of images has been going on from the earliest days of photography, as we witnessed in part one, with photographers' studios touching up photos, or painting in colours, or adding vignettes. Or more dramatically, newspapers or governments altering images to increase their visual impact, or for propaganda purposes. So it's probably best not to get too worked up about the post-processing and manipulation of digital files, and accept that it's actually been an integral part of photography all along. It's just that software has now given us all the ability to play with and hopefully improve our images. After the development of digital point-and-shoot and DSLR cameras, we saw the introduction of mirrorless cameras, or more specifically, mirrorless digital cameras with interchangeable lenses, because digital point-and-shoot cameras were mirrorless all along. There's quite a convoluted history of evolution for mirrorless interchangeable lens cameras, not just the mirrorless part, but also the digital display system for live preview. The first commercial mirrorless camera was made by Epson in 2004, the Epson RD1. It was a digital rangefinder camera with a 6.1 megapixel crop sensor and a one-to-one -one optical viewfinder. It used a Leica M lens mount. It was very expensive, costing $3,000 at its launch. Then, as we've already seen, Leica developed the M8 rangefinder camera in 2006. And as you might expect, it was even more expensive than the Epson. The first really successful mass market commercial camera in this category is generally considered to be the Panasonic Lumix DMC G1, released in 2008, which was also the first camera of a micro four thirds system. The G1 had a 12.1 megapixel sensor, and unlike the Epson and Leica, it had autofocus. It was also considerably cheaper than those cameras. After 2008, the Micro Four Thirds system was developed further by manufacturers such as Panasonic and Olympus, while companies such as Sony, Nikon, Canon, Fuji and Samsung, and others, went down the crop sensor route. Sony was one of the most serious entrants into the crop sensor mirrorless market, 
following on from their successful point-and-shoot digital cameras. In 2010, they launched the Next 3 and Next 4 compact mirrorless cameras that proved to be very successful and forerunners of the Alpha series. I've used one of these crop sensors on the Alpha cameras for many years, the A6000. It was released in 2014 and became one of the very best sellers of the digital era, despite its downsides. It doesn't come with a particularly good kit lens. The camera's ergonomics are questionable, it's not great to hold and it has some oddly placed and fiddly controls. The electronic viewfinder and rear screen provide heaps of data, and while that's very impressive, they're not the best in class, and the menu is a mess. But it's not an expensive camera and it has a reasonable sensor and a good range of features for still photographs and video support. You get access to a number of perfectly decent E-mount lenses or you can adapt older film mirror lenses and have a lot of fun. One of the advantages of mirrorless cameras of course is you can use old lenses with no mirror to hit the rear of the lens, something that can happen with some DSLRs. And some of the old film mirror lenses are really quite good. Or at worst, they're eccentric and fun and cheap to try compared to new lenses. So cameras like the A6000 are compact and good value for money. And these have always been important selling points when you're producing cameras for the mass market. In contrast to the Sony, it's worth noting that not all crop sensor mirrorless cameras have been that successful. I like this one from Pentax, the K01. It's actually one of the earlier mirrorless cameras from 2012 with a distinctive brick-like design by Mark Newson. It wasn't very compact or comfortable to hold. I should preface this by saying that the K01 isn't the only rather eccentric or unsuccessful digital camera introduced by respected brands, including Leica, Hasselblad, Fuji, Nikon and Canon. The K01 came with this very cute, tiny 40mm f2.8 lens that's an excellent performer, not just on this camera, but also on much more powerful full-frame cameras. Who says that digital lenses have to be huge, at least those that are not ultra-fast? And I like the collection of in-camera processing filters the camera offers. It has a rather good sensor made by Sony, who are building a strong share of the market for sensors. However, if any camera demonstrates why the sensor is not the only thing that counts, then it's this camera. It doesn't have a viewfinder, and the rear screen is hard to see in bright light. That might be okay if you could trust the autofocus, but you can't. It tends to lock onto things that you don't want it to. Far too many family snaps have been ruined by out-of-focus images with this camera. Having used this camera and then moved to the Sony Alpha series cameras, it's chalk and cheese in terms of autofocus. The Sonys have a superb, fast and generally accurate system, and this makes a huge difference to the number of keepers you can get from the camera. A high-speed and accurate autofocus system is one of the major innovations in digital cameras that all manufacturers have sought to emulate. So far I've been talking about smaller sensor cameras, but again, some photographers really wanted full-frame sensors in their mirrorless cameras, for reasons we've already discussed for DSLRs. I've already posted a YouTube video on the differences between old film mirror lenses and today's digital lenses, and the differences between film and digital sensors, so I won't repeat the discussion here. Suffice it to say that modern lenses are optimised to perform best on digital sensors, unlike film mirror lenses. Modern lenses generally have better coatings on the front and rear elements to minimise light flares and reflections. And manufacturers sell different lens styles and speeds and prices to suit different customer needs in a more targeted way across prime and zoom lenses. In terms of autofocus, one particular development in lens design has been the introduction of focus by wire in digital lenses to replace a motor-geared focus mechanism coupled to the focus ring. The focus by wire system is electronic and provides quick and simple focusing. Personally, I like the touch and feel of old mechanical focus rings, but I also appreciate the speed and accuracy of the best autofocus systems. The first mass market full frame mirrorless interchangeable lens camera was the Sony A7, introduced in 2013, and it wasn't until 2018 that companies like Nikon and Canon introduced their full-frame alternatives. So you could see that Sony had quite a period of time to consolidate its market share. In theory, taking up the bulky mirror pentaprism enables manufacturers to produce smaller, more compact cameras, even with full-frame sensors. In practice, as we've seen throughout the history of high-end cameras, full-frame mirrorless cameras have tended to grow in size as more and more complex functions are introduced, including, for example, image stabilization systems. 
as well as electronic components for higher power processing and advanced video technologies. And many lenses have also grown in size, as the optical performance of lenses tries to keep up with the details captured by the sensors and the processing algorithms. Greater megapixel sensor sizes, as well as the improved performance of computer-aided lens designs, has introduced us all to the wonders of pixel peeping, and a fascination with high-definition sharpness on the one hand, and extremely narrow depth of field, blurry bouquet images from ultra-fast lenses on the other. So have mirrorless cameras following on from DSLRs and point-and-shoot cameras resulted in a further revolution and renaissance in popular photography? Well, that's open to debate, but I'd say no, they haven't. Mirrorless cameras with interchangeable lenses have simply given us more electronic tools and lenses to play with. And it's interesting to know that highly regarded and popular mirrorless cameras, produced by Fuji in particular, have more than a nod to the past, with retro styling and a sizable collection of manual dials to control settings on top, with the option to adapt old film era lenses, as well as in-camera film simulations and presets to give images an old film look. This brings us on crucially to the advent of mobile phone or cell phone or smartphone cameras or cameras on tablets. For simplicity, I'll call this group phone cameras from now on. There are articles and features online about the development of phone cameras where you can go into much greater detail if you want. Essentially, the first phone cameras were sold in 2000 with the Sharp J SH04 being acknowledged as the first truly commercially available phone. It had tiny image sizes, a fraction of a megapixel. There's a fun review of the Sharp on the BBC website from 2001 if you'd like to see how people responded to the concept at the time. I think there was a feeling of slight bemusement from the reviewer, not knowing how people would use the phone. Maybe it was just for the youth market, but then maybe it was too expensive for that market. But the below-the-line comments definitely point to the huge future impact of camera phones. It took a bit of time for camera phones to really take off, but by the end of 2003, phones were good enough and cheap enough to attract over 80 million users, with leading providers including Sanyo, Sprint, Sony, Nokia and Samsung. Image size and quality improved considerably, and you could share photos wirelessly, unlike the earliest phone cameras that you needed to hook up to computers to access the images. And then, in 2007, Apple launched its first iPhone with a touchscreen that replaced most physical buttons. The rear camera on the iPhone had a resolution of 2 megapixels and also featured geotagging. The way users could flick through and view images was enhanced by the software Apple provided and the quality of the phone's relatively large LCD screen. The iPhone was subsequently given more and more powerful rear and front cameras for selfies and so on and had a huge impact on the market, Apple's competitors and also on sales of conventional cameras. For many people, phone cameras are really the only type of camera they need to use these days for everyday snaps. And if you go to tourist hotspots or events, then you'll see the majority of people, sometimes the vast majority of people, are using phone cameras. And this is not a generational thing. It's not just the younger generation who are using phone cameras exclusively. They're also popular with older people, people who own or have owned point-and-shoot cameras or DSLRs or even mirrorless cameras. And you can hardly blame people of all ages for using phone cameras. It's such a convenient way of taking photos, built into the phones that you carry around in your pockets or bags and use every day. If you see someone or something you want to snap, you pull out the phone and you let the phone camera do all the work. At the same time, the phones have all the built-in wireless communications links required to instantaneously access the internet and send photos to family and friends, or post photos on different apps or channels. Modern digital cameras also have these internet upload links, but let's be honest, it's not the same experience. The quality of phone photos can be very good, especially if you're only viewing the image on a small screen, and phone manufacturers continue to make improvements to the resolution and details of images produced by their phones and integrated lenses. A significant reason for the improvement of phone cameras is the sophistication of the technology they use, including the development of computational photography. Computational photography enables phone cameras to do things that were not possible with a single snap through a camera lens, such as combining multiple images into one image to improve sharpness, or automatically processing images to give an image more depth of field, and giving a portrait a more 3D look in isolation by blurring the background, plus all the fun tools and apps to distort images and faces or change their context. And all this sophisticated technology is packed into a small, thin phone body 
although there's always that development tendency to go up market and build bigger. Phone cameras, the internet and apps, they've all led to an astronomical increase in the number of images being shared by ordinary people around the world and the numbers of views those photos receive. But are the photos any good? Now, I don't personally believe that the use of phone cameras is detrimental to popular photography, or even the art of taking photos. On the contrary, they've led to a tremendous increase in interest in photography, and different styles of photography, and a heightened awareness of the impact that people's photos have on others, positive and negative. People can be as serious in taking photos with phones, as others are with expensive DSLRs or mirrorless cameras. They take a lot of pride in getting good photos. They know how to spot interesting subjects. They're acutely aware of the need to get a good composition of those subjects. And they have the opportunity to share photos in global online forums and channels about how good or bad their photos are. So while I'm not discounting the relevance or sheer enjoyment of using standalone cameras in any way, there's no denying the major impact that phone cameras have on popular photography today. The advent of phone cameras, to continue a theme we've seen throughout the history of cameras, has led to another revolution and renaissance in photography. More and more people are taking and sharing photos, and more and more people are looking at photos online. And this is where there are parallels between the introduction of cameras like Kodak's Vest Pocket Camera and the introduction of the phone camera, with a gap of around a hundred years in between. Both cameras were revolutionary in their own way, and both cameras took popular photography to a new level a renaissance in photography, in the sense that they helped many more people to become actively engaged in photography. The vest pocket camera was easy to carry around and use, a response to the more bulky box brownie cameras. And the phone camera is also so pocketable and convenient compared to bulky standalone cameras, even point-and-shoot cameras. Now, when I started to think about the conclusions of this video and the future of cameras, I wonder whether manufacturers needed to focus on making smaller cameras to compete with phone cameras, especially smaller mirrorless interchangeable lens cameras with more compact lenses. Mirrorless cameras may have started from a smaller is better premise, but they've sometimes developed a bigger is better philosophy, mainly because manufacturers have been trying to include all the new features that technological advancements can offer, a trend we've seen many times in history and a trend that is only reverse when further innovations reduce the size of the physical hardware. However, on reflection, the situation is not as simple as this. Standalone cameras can't possibly hope to compete directly with phone cameras. It may all be about photography, but they're just not the same market. Manufacturers can offer cameras with unique features and capabilities that distinguish them clearly from phone cameras. But people will invariably carry a phone camera as well, and the key point is that while they may leave their standalone camera at home, they'll never leave the phone at home. The speed and ease with which you can take decent sharp images outside and inside with the latest phones is impressive, even in very poor light, and phone manufacturers continue to innovate their hardware, software, apps and features. And there's no doubt there are places and situations where you can use phone cameras when it's not really practical to use standalone cameras, or even not allowed. If you stand outside a security-sensitive place like the US Embassy in London, for example, with a full camera kit taking photos, you'll probably be questioned by the police. Whereas if you get your phone out for a quick snap, it won't be a problem. The same is true for stadiums and some other public places, where photography with a professional-looking camera is discouraged or not permitted. It's a sign of the times that iPhones and tablets are now the most commonly used cameras on some popular online photography sites. But this isn't the end of the road for standalone cameras. It's likely that the different segments we've covered in this history of cameras will remain in place for at least the foreseeable future. The point-and-shoot cameras, DSLRs, rangefinders, and mirrorless cameras, and so on. Even if some of these segments continue to shrink dramatically in size and only support a handful of producers. There'll always be a place for standalone cameras and specialist lenses amongst professional photographers and serious amateurs. And bloggers and videographers will probably want the option of using a camera setup instead of phones. Photojournalists, one of the classic groups of camera users, may prefer to use phones because they're less intrusive, but that's a niche market. And I don't think the younger generation will necessarily abandon standalone cameras. As long as cameras offer an experience that phones cannot provide by being tactile and interesting and sometimes challenging to use. 
In the future, this tactile element may become more important with cameras that look and feel beautiful to touch because that's probably the best way of encouraging some people to pick up a camera and be happy to be seen with a camera that has the wow factor without costing too much money. I also hope that some cameras will become simpler and stop trying to be all things to all people. For example, I'd personally love to own a digital SLR camera with the simplicity of a Spotmatic, specifically to use old lenses. No video, manual and auto settings, plus an exposure compensation dial. That's all. And one thing is certain, over the course of history, cameras like the vest pocket and the phone camera have dramatically increased people's interests in photography, which can only be a good thing. So that's the end of this series. We've covered a lot of ground over the past 200 years or so, all the way from camera obscura and the earliest daguerreotype camera to today's phone cameras. It's been a fascinating journey, and along the way, I've personally learned a lot about many different types of camera, the technological innovations, and the impact of cameras on popular photography in their own eras. I very much enjoyed reading your comments below each video, and I'm very grateful for all your inputs and suggestions. If you haven't seen parts one and two of the series, here are the links, and many thanks for watching.